My fascination is uh, chips. Um, of course, not the kind of chips that you find in a bag you buy at the, at the grocery store, but uh, chips that you find in our modern devices like smartphones uh, and so on. And my fascination actually started uh, as a kid. Uh, you know, when with a screwdriver you take apart toys or worse, your parents' uh, electronics. And very quickly you get frustrated because inside the thing that really has the good stuff are those chips, packaged in gray or, or black plastic. When studying in Leuven, um, the veil was lifted a little bit by some excellent uh, professors who started to tell us about you know, how you build a chip, how you even design a chip that complex, and how you manufacture uh, those things. And today I work uh, at an R&D center down the road called IMEC, <clears throat> where we help the whole chip ecosystem advance the technology to the next phase and the next phase, so that every year we can do a little more with this technology. We can store more information, we can communicate data faster, we can compute faster. And of course, it has big implications on things like um, the ability to uh, have a car drive by itself, or the ability to project, for example, uh, to our visual field, a completely virtual uh, environment. Um, now, <clears throat> what we're actually doing when we're building chips is we're sculpting materials at, at the nanoscale. And the, the platform works with wafers, so disks of, uh, of silicon material that are very pure, uh, very, very um, uh, high quality materials that undergo a large number of steps, typically a couple of hundred steps, before at the output, at the end, you have, um, you have a chip or a collection of chips. And in fact, in that process, for a trillion components at the same time, you're putting every atom, roughly speaking, where it needs to be. And then you end up with these uh, products which have a couple of billion switches that uh, talk to each other at a frequency of a couple of billion times a second with massive amounts of wiring that connects it all, all together. And you can buy those things for a couple of bucks. So of course, this technology has really impacted our lives I think in a very profound way, we, we don't always realize it, but the technology is with us all the time. We communicate a lot all the time, we compute, in fact, all the time, and we store a lot of data. So I could actually fill a, a talk or a number of talks by the exciting things that are yet to come by making the technology even better, more computation, more storage, and so on. And that would be very exciting, but that's not what I'm going to do. I'm actually uh, even more excited about another dimension of this technology, and that is the exploitation of the platform that's already there um, to impact our lives in a much more direct way. And that's in fact uh, in a way that impacts the way we care about our health. So these are really chips to, um, to impact healthcare. So let me start with an example. Um, this is the chip that for some of you have seen chips before, it looks kind of ordinary. You see these colors which um, are caused by the way it reflects of the fine features in the chip. But there's a needle sticking out of these chips. And if you look at the details of the needle, if you zoom in, you'd actually find uh, an array, a matrix uh, of electrodes that are there to be able to talk to neurons. So both uh, speak to and listen uh, to neurons, individual cells in the brain, so we can, first of all, try and understand uh, how the brain works in a much more profound, profound way. So these are chips whose entire purpose is not to end up in a smartphone or, or a tablet, but to end up in the brain of an animal. These are research tools so we can build a much better uh, understanding of how the brain works, first in animals, uh, ultimately also in humans, and we can try and figure out um, how, to, um, uh, how to treat diseases like Alzheimer's uh, a, lot, a lot better. Another example of something where we see chips um, starting to play a role is in spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is something that um, many of you uh, may have this slide because it's a, it's a lab exercise you've got to do a bit of, with a large piece of um, a large instrument um, that can measure a spectra, let's say from wine or another substance. These are techniques today confined to the lab. Um, however, they're very powerful. They reveal the molecular makeup of substance. So for example, if you're about to eat an apple, you actually might want to know what the molecular makeup is of that apple. What nutrition does it contain? Um, does it contain any allergens? Does it contain any toxins that I should be aware of? Today, simply impossible for a consumer to do that. The instrumentation is expensive, bulky, and requires uh, expertise to operate it. Um, 
chip technology allows you to take the same functionality, so this is more than electronics, electronics and optics, and move it all onto a chip, so you can make it very compact, fit it inside a smartphone or a smartwatch, uh, and also build it for just a couple of euros. So and any one of us can use it. Now, we're not there yet. There's still a lot of work required to get this to work. Uh, but in the near future, we'll all be seeing these spectroscopic devices, molecular sensors uh, in our general purpose devices, which we carry around with us uh, anyway, like our smartphones. Um, when we think about health, um, DNA is very important. The topic came up uh, earlier already in the forensic context. But even when we're still alive, your DNA is very interesting um, for many reasons. Um, what the graph that you see here, you may have seen before, it's a graph that shows um, how the cost of sequencing a human genome has come down by about 100,000 times. That's a really big drop in cost uh, over uh, about 15 years. So today it costs, roughly speaking, about 1,000 euros to sequence a human genome. Now, that's not good enough. And the reason is that in the future, we'll be sequencing more and more. We won't only sequence our genome once. We'll actually keep monitoring, monitoring it because it tells us a lot about our health status. It may tell us about a cancer that's about to appear. So it's very important that we figure out how to make sequencing better, cheaper, and faster. There are also chips play an enormous role. Um, this is a, a project that um, uh, we got involved in a couple of years ago with a company based in Silicon Valley called uh, Pacific Biosciences. And they had a beautiful uh, DNA sequencing technique uh, that's based on reading a single molecule in real time. Um, now that sounds difficult, and it is, and that's why the instrument that they created to do this was uh, a, f um, um, a fantastic piece of engineering. You see it uh, behind me on the left-hand side. It's a very large instrument, costs three quarters of a million dollars if you want to buy it. It's very heavy and it's a great piece of engineering. But because it measures single molecules at a time, it's also very limited in how many it can do at a given time. And that's exactly where, what chips are good in. If you can actually take a principle, put it on a chip, it's relatively easy to then make a million copies of it so you can speed up the process dramatically. That's the secret to computation, to storage, memory storage. It's also the secret here. So here, by taking their biochemistry and putting it on a, on a new chip, that is a combination of electrical technologies and optical technologies, the same principle became in one iteration seven times faster, uh, the instrument became a lot smaller, and it's also significantly uh, cheaper. So this is a very real way in which the technologies that you and I have subsidized by buying smartphones and so on, actually has resulted in much better tools that will ultimately also benefit all of us because it allows us to monitor our DNA um, in a much more, in a much better, much cheaper way. Um, <clears throat> this is a little different. This is a chip um, that is really a container. So it's a, it's a piece of silicon. There's a small chamber in there, a cavity, that we can heat up and cool down very quickly. And what it's used for is not to sequence DNA, but to, um, to amplify DNA. So it's, a, it's a technique that's often used, for example, if you want to discover whether in somebody's blood there's a trace of a virus. What you would do is you would look for that virus using a molecular probe, and then you would amplify that specific piece of DNA that tells you whether you have that virus. The process is called polymerase chain reaction. It's one of the... Um, uh, um, one of the most commonly used tests in the clinical lab. Now, it takes about an hour. So if you were hoping to do this while you're facing a doctor, for example, you know, there's just no way you're going to do this. The, the operation itself takes about, about an hour. It takes, it's done on a fairly big instrument, so you've got to take a blood sample, take it to the lab, do the experiment, come back. It takes a lot of time. Now, the same reaction you can actually perform uh, in a silicon chip, now, not electrical, but a fluidic chip uh, in, over the course of only three minutes. And that's interesting because now this whole measurement can take place in the context of your interaction with a physician. And you can actually talk to the physician, get the diagnosis, and start on treatment right away. This is something similar. Uh, this is a technique where instead of using a microscope to look at cells, the image you see on the right-hand side are, are red blood cells. You might recognize their donut shape for those of you familiar. Um, but these pictures are not taken with a microscope. They were, in fact, taken with a smartphone camera chip without any lenses whatsoever. In fact, all of the lenses in this microscope 
have been replaced by software. So it's computational microscopy, making use of the fact that imaging chips, ca camera sensors have become cheap, have become very performant, because we all want to take pictures in the dark uh, with many megapixels. And computation also has become incredibly cheap so that you can actually replace the function of the lenses with cheap and very fast uh, computation. And you can use this method to take pictures of cells and classify them very quickly so that a, an, a measurement which was previously analog, where you had to look at cells and sort of figure out what they were, it now becomes a digital measurement. You can keep complete records of what you're doing. If you wanted to take a sample later on again, you can do so because it's a fully digital file and you can again reanalyze the, uh, the data. So where is all of this heading? Um, um, because everything I showed you, the last three things I showed you, are really lab demonstrations. And we would like to push it into the hands of, of people, of course. And for that reason, we partner with uh, Johns Hopkins um, University, and more specifically, Johns Hopkins uh, Medicine. Um, Johns Hopkins, um, as many of you may know, is a, is a paragon of a medical institution. Right? They're, they have a, they're excellent, uh, really top in, in education, in research, and also in patient care. And so we work with uh, Johns Hopkins to get these um, these techniques like microscopy and PCR on a chip to get them into the hands of users in a, rel in a relatively short amount of time. And the vision is that uh, where we're going to end up are small disposables, so small um, throwaway things that you buy for a couple of bucks. And that thing can do a complete lab analysis. The technology that goes into it, of course, is again silicon technology because it gives you a lot of sensing capabilities a lot of um, uh, sample manipulation capabilities, all in a very compact form factor. And if you build it the right way, can be manufactured really cheaply, typically in an Asian uh, manufacturing plant. Now, this little lab will then talk to a device you already own anyway, your smartphone, your tablet. Uh, for a grandma, it may be the TV set, anything with a, with a wireless connection. Uh, and then the data will be relayed to the cloud for further uh, analysis. The data can then go to your doctor. It can go to an expert system, which takes fully automated decisions. It can come back to you in some kind of format that you're also then able to, to understand. It's a very flexible system, uh, and data can be routed to wherever it's going to, be, uh, going to be needed. What's unique about what we're trying to do here is that um, this little piece is not just a thing to measure one thing. For example, it's not just a glucose strip that measures glucose, but it's really a lab platform that allows you to port many of the lab tests onto this thing which you can actually use at home or wherever you are. And we think that's really important because today, if you want to get healthier or stay healthy, it's fundamentally important that you can measure. You need to measure a number of biomarkers, a number of analytes. Today, that's a huge pain. You have to go to a doctor's office, uh, or to a lab, get blood drawn, uh, get, the blood gets set, sent to the lab, gets analyzed, it come, comes back. There's a huge delay of at least a day, maybe more. While that sounds trivial, that, is a, that, that represents a lot of friction in the, in the, um, uh, in the act of trying to, to keep you healthy. Because when you face a doctor the first time, he or she is in that context. You've just spoken for 10 minutes or five minutes, you know the person, you get an idea what's wrong, you want to be able to help the person right away. If you have to wait for the data to come back the next day or maybe the next week, you're completely out of context, you've got to restart the whole conversation, it's a huge amount of friction. We want to take the friction out and enable a health measurement uh, anywhere, anytime, and even by anyone, even unskilled, um, unskilled persons. So I think this future will be here sooner than um, you all realize. I think it's very exciting, and I hope you, uh, you'll share my excitement. Thank you.